Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to TNO, the last days of Europe, in which we are playing as the Empire of Japan. I'm Mr. Mokulover, of course, and right now we're looking at the House of Peers, in which we must decide who we shall support in the upcoming years, but regardless, we have the importance of Manchurian steel. Manchuria has been a prized possession of Japan for many decades now. The vast tons of steel located in said northeastern regions of China had become the cornerstone stock for the entire co-prosperity sphere. Iron would be mined from the earth in huge quantities and then brought to the cities in the south to be smelted and processed from there. The steel would be shipped across to the rest of the sphere. Day after day, week after week, the demand for Manchurian steel has never ceased. In fact, it only seems to grow more insistent by the hour. Steel was a pillar upon which nearly every part of modern existence was built. With Manchuria having no real com competition in terms of steel production, it was vital to ensure that it all was well with the economy there. Should it fall behind, then the precious web of supply and demand could easily start to unravel. The local Manchurian government was also required to make regular and particularly detailed reports into the financial situation of the steel industry. While the steel was still Manchuria, it was kept closely guarded throughout its entire journey. It was not uncommon for the military to directly oversee the transportation of some shipments, even going as far as stationing soldiers on board along the occasional Navy warship. It became something of a common joke to claim that stealing state secrets was easier than running off with a single steel bar. The time for another report soon approaches, and we have the Met. Mika Washima train crash. Ooh, I don't want to click on that. I don't want to lose political power. But regardless, we must decide now who we shall support because I asked you about this yesterday. So we have Kido the Kidoites, Tagaki the, from the Liberals, Miki for the Independents, Conservatives are led by Ino, and the Formists are led by Kaya. So let's see. We talked about these guys yesterday. We actually spent a lot of time talking about them. And overall, there's overwhelming support at the time of this recording for me to play or to choose and lead the nation eventually, hopefully as Takaki. Takaki. There's overwhelming support for this guy and discredit faction, opposition, wait, opposition levels. Launch slander campaign. So right now we're not doing too bad. Attack publicly. Um, I don't want to attack him, so let's see. The blue block has quite a bit of support. I'm gonna, hmm. I'm gonna wait. Let's wait first. So, but anyways, let's center other spheres workforce. China, with its large size and population, made for the perfect place for industrial and agricultural development. Although already the second largest economy in the sphere, China's true economic potential is yet untapped. For this reason, much had been invested by both Japan itself and the local Chinese government to modernize the extensive areas of land available for use. It was a popular goal indeed, as most Japanese and Chinese politicians wished to see it completed as soon as possible. China already provided the absolute majority of workers for the entire sphere, providing Japan's power block with everything from weaponry to everyday electronics. These factories were owned by Japanese companies, using them to produce ubiquitous, yet simple goods for maximum profit. The coastal cities had expanded greatly over the decades, but it was still the Gagarian countryside that made it the largest part of Chinese economy. Most of the sphere's food supply came from China, with most of the inland country still being used for aiding this purpose. It was a manner in which farming had conducted that had changed somewhat, however. Where rural communities had once sustained their way of life through farming, corporations now controlled vast areas of land, using it to cultivate their produce on the wildest possible scale. Entire villages could be em employed by the same company, all working to produce the same foodstuff. Labor was kept cheap through the disposability of individual workers, who could be very easily replaced by one in ten, who were desperate for work. The ratio of the system meant that there was seemingly always room for expansion, always more opportunity to open more factories or to expand the farmlands. It was becoming increasingly common for most sphere-based companies to center their centers of production in China. Here, as the CEOs put it, they could operate freely and without nuisance of regulation that they faced back home indeed. They made use of China's difficult position to the very fullest. A difficult situation indeed. So here, okay, oh, military austerity, we probably, well, let's cut that back. And we're also training our navy, if I remember correctly from the last video. Uh, let's see. So this looks like the biggest group, followed by this group, the independents, and then the reformists. Let's see about Miki. We can discredit every, available every 14 days. So what does this mean? Strength of their dominance. Thankfully, all the people need to switch sides is learning just how bad the current benefactors are, even if it means being just somewhat exaggerated. Attack publicly? So 2%, is that, is that war support? $50 million to launch a slander campaign? 2% what? Oh, political power. A 25 political power and something else. So, we did that, and we'll see what happens. Oh, support in the House of Peers. Oh, whoops. 60% now. Oh, approval, duh. Public support is crucial to the government wishing to safely rule over the state, and the Empire of Japan is not an exception to this. The Prime Minister's public or government thrives and shrivels under the public's watchful eye, and their demeanor is crucial to how much support the ruling faction has in the House of Representatives. Falling below 30% will rapidly diminish the ruling party's faction. Oh, you see, yeah, not bad. High, so the support of the House of Peers is viable uh, to have for any 
So Prime Minister of Japan, as is a House of Peers and Privy Council that ultimately nominate the Prime Minister to begin with. As such, keeping them content is of paramount importance. Should their support fall below 50%, the Prime Minister's reign falls in critical danger and may collapse. Not bad. Cool. Let's go into this as well. Civilian spending. 304 million. Urgh, that's so much. So much. I would like some more political power, but we're doing okay already. I'm not going to touch it. I think it's okay where it's at. Yes, debt's going to get increased quite a bit, but what am I to do? We have nothing here. we got social measures. And China reports positive economic growth. The economic report from the Republic of China was due. Once again, Prime Minister Eno awaited its arrival. The Chinese economy has always been a significant issue for Japan since its integration into the co-prosperity sphere. China served as the breadbasket of the bloc, providing vast quantities of food to each member state, yet even this was not enough. China's vast area of population and resources made it a perfect location to build a massive industrial hub. This was a grand project that Eno and his predecessors desired to see completed. The Prime Minister hoped that the economic report would remind the Chinese government how pressing this matter was. With the dossier now on his desk, Eno began to pour over its contents. The Prime Minister had expected to see some progress towards industrial development. He had demanded it, after all. But the report suggested that China was well on its way towards industrialization. After many years of difficult progression, it seems that China has had or just entered a new phase of modernization. Although the industrial sector was beginning to grow larger, agriculture too had experienced a massive leap in output. The Prime Minister was pleased to see that his message had finally been properly understood. The path was open for China, and in Eno's mind he had showed them the way. China grows ever more valuable. I hope nothing bad happens over there. That wouldn't be very good. Let's grab Army Interoperability. Cool. It would be really bad if we were to lose China. Oh no, that would be very bad. Hopefully we can evolve though. Maybe not, maybe we'll see what happens. And what's next? So we spent some political power earlier. 1.12, oh we lost some political power too. Because of advisor level last time. We had trouble in Mongolia, which we kind of fixed up actually. Are they still, oh they went, hmm. Oh, oh, we can't, we, so you can't manually invite a faction in TNO, which makes sense. These guys are losing, but Bengali textiles. Azad Hind had always been a useful contributor to the economy of the sphere, although not quite the same size as its rival government to the west. Bose had attempted to make the most of his territory. Modernization has always been a key goal of his, and now the cities and farmlands of free India exported much of their products and produce to the co prosperity sphere market. Bengal, in particular, has created many goods considered highly sought after, and most notably, the region's renowned textile work. Ever since the days of the Roman Empire, these fine works of handicraft have been sought after across the world. British rule in India had only increased the worldwide demand for Bengali textiles, manufacturing increasing t or increased to new heights, as new machinery was brought in to increase the amount of textiles produced. Although now independent from British rule, not much has changed in the ways of demand for textiles. The exportation of these goods was now a way to sustain the economy of an independent, if somewhat inconsistently, recognized nation. Their popularity in Japan and the wider sphere ensured that the demand for Bengali textiles never seemed to drop, yet the situation regarding the rest of the sphere's economy troubled many. Despite the efforts of Subhas Chandra Bose to increase industrialization, the overwhelming majority of land in free India was still being used for agriculture. The crops that were produced were needed for feeding the population and could therefore not contribute much to the economy. It was for this reason that the textile industry was so fiercely protected. Should the trend of agrarianism not be ended, the collapse of one industry could deal significant damage to Azad Hin for years to come. Now, double your efforts. Good, I'm glad we have these guys over here. The Mongolian Civil War. From Taiga to British Seas, the Red Army stands above all. Oh. Okay. Oh, can ensure continued prosperity. We've only gone through literally four focuses so far. Cool, whatever. Maximize growth. Hey, more construction speed. Yeah, why not? Maximize growth. Why not? Or maximizing growth. First, we must facilitate as much growth as possible for our economy. By creating more and more construction projects and military contracts, we can further develop these islands while keeping the West at bay. While some spiritless economists claim that our growth will not last forever and investments should be made with the long term in mind, those are irrelevant. By letting our economic potential reach the heavens, we shall be unchallengeable. What could go wrong? Absolutely nothing. Free India delivers the honest answer. The last of the nations due to send their economic reports to Tokyo was the Azad Hin government. Free India was on the periphery of the co-prosperity sphere, so their time of reporting was no surprise nor concern. Eno, sitting in his office, had just received a phone call verifying that the report had arrived at Tokyo airport just an under an hour ago. Upon its arrival to his personal estate, Eno asked for the precious documents to be delivered to him immediately. Once the documents that the report consisted of had been brought to Eno's office, he wasted no time in reading them. Report on the economy of Free India and the title page sim said simply, Outlined over three pages of texts, charts, and graphs was the stark truth of East India's economy. The report did not outline a disastrous situation. The economy was in fact managing to stay afloat, but at a far a level far below the expectations of Japanese projections. It did not appear that the situation was too likely to shift radically in the coming years. Azad Hin would remain a mostly agrarian society for a good while yet, and at the 
At the bottom of the last page was a small section entitled Plans for Stimulating Economic Growth. Yet by that point, Eno had stopped reading. Solutions to the problem that he had just been made aware of seemed rather useless at the moment. Up until that point, the Prime Minister had assumed that the situation in Azad Hind was entirely positive. Now, it was clear uh, that a significant member of the sphere was financially lagging far behind what was expected. The copies of the report would soon begin to circulate in wider economic political crisis, uh, uh, political circles, which would only hasten its impact. Eno was left wondering if there was some way to put the spotlight on the transparency of the report, although that still led directly to the problems it presented. Let us hope next year proves more promising. Do you have unique focus tree? No, you don't. Military administration of the East Bengal, private military contractors, as well as persecution of Abrahamic faiths. No, you need focus tree? That's interesting. Bloody Sunday. Across the white marble floor of a Yasuda bank, shredded an officer of the Imperial Japanese Army, dressed from boots to peaked cap and formal attire, wearing a face of dispassion, underlined by the self-righteous jingoism of a military man. A cleric operating a station at the counter of the bank looked up with two-part surprise and unease at the sight of the officer approaching him. Upon reaching the clerk's station, the officer wasted no time on formalities, saying that I would like to speak to the manager of this financial establishment. Sir, if it's alright, anything you would say to the manager, you can say to me. My job entails doing the tasks that the manager is otherwise too busy to, to perform on his own. If this is a matter of a loan, I could bring out the necessary papers. This is a matter of utmost importance, the officer stated through his gritted teeth. I would like to discuss with the manager the matter of a loan to the Showa Sionan Shipping and Receiving Corporation. The loan has already been requested, but we are experiencing delays pertaining to incompetence on your end, and the original amount of money requested was denied in favor of a smaller amount. This behavior is unacceptable. The officer slowly leaned forward, putting his hands together on the counter. His gloves stretched and his knuckles cracked. If I may inquire, officer, what does the army have to do with... <clears throat> you may not. I would like to meet with your manager immediately. I warn you, boy, you would not dare to show insubordination in front of a division of army soldiers. And so you shall not show insubordination in front of me. The scowl on the officer's face transformed into a look of hatred and insecurity. The clerk stared back in fear before clumsily opening the hatch to the counter so that the officer could enter. F follow me, sir. We still live in the wild. The support of the House of Peers increases somewhat. We should probably keep this open. House of Peers? Oh, that's not bad. Takagi, we want to get him high up, so. I Oh, IJA. Oh, Imperial Armed Forces. Increase the budget for these guys? Decrease the budget? Won't be liked by them, but at least it'll save us some money. Less expenditures. Less support. Paranoia. What, what does paranoia do? The Navy, Navi, Navy is currently dominating the Navy, huh? The military. As an abstract measure of Jap Japanese military's unhingedness and willingness to take actions into their own hands, a possible extremely dangerous problem for the Empire of Japan. The higher paranoia becomes, the more infighting the military suffers, and the lesser the government's control over the military becomes. Training programs, more expenditure, more support, less paranoia, available every month. Fight inter-service corruption, every, available every 48 days. Less support, less support, less paranoia. Remove General HQ's command role. Oh boy. Can we get, like, coup if we do this enough? Way more money. Whoa. Minus 25% paranoia. 43. Um. We'll do that one. Why not? Let's try it. Oh. And more support. Well, what if we do this? Uh, support. More paranoia. More paranoia. Oh, if we do this, we're going to be more and more paranoid. Uh, what if we had no support from anybody? Uh. Sa Sasakawa wants funding. <clears throat> a gang tai received a letter from a famous philanthropist and innovative entrepreneur, Sasakawa Ryochi. He is establishing a new oil company based around the Sakhalin fields and is wondering if Eno's government would be interested in subsidizing this enterprise. The prospecting operation was successful and a large and profitable fuel was found. Sasakawa, Sasakawa believes that expanding oil extraction in the area would be a good way to make the Sakhalin economy less dependent on agriculture and could potentially bring in a lot of educated workers. Long term, it could even involve Toyohara in, into an important center in our empire's far north. Certainly a good idea. Eno is, however, unsure if it is best to handle the request. Within the Kantai, give it to Kishi Nobosuke. In Manchuria, he could possibly integrate it into a larger economic plans for the North. Eno will handle it personally. Let's let's just say Eno will handle it personally. What could go wrong, right? How do I screw this up? So Sa Sasakawa's funding. Having decided to handle the matter for the new Sakhalin oil fields himself, it was now time for Prime Minister Eno to de determine the amount or appropriate amount of funding to distribute. Sasakawa, although a member of the opposition in the Diet and a man embroiled in corruption of the highest order, was still a businessman that could not simply be ignored. His numerous enterprises and contributions to the war from the past decades had ensured that he would remain influential whether the government wished it or not. Now they had discovered oil, ever precious and essential to the function of the sphere. Sasakawa had the full attention of the Kantai. Subsidizing his oil fields would be no cheap matter, as was the case with everything involving oil 
extraction, there were risks to consider as well, caution suggesting that only a small sum should be given to Sasakawa, lest this venture fail spectacularly. Yet other voices suggested that Sasakawa's businesses in Sakhalin was more than sound enough to deserve a generous investment. <clears throat> The rewards would surely be great. If all went as well, Sasakawa would be describing it to be, having heard both sides being put forward. Prime Minister Ino would now have the final say. A bit, a little bit over the required. This deserves more funding than usual. Nothing can go wrong if we try to get more oil, right? This deserves more funding than normal, right? Absolutely. Budget-wise, how are we looking? Only a billion every year, that's all. More money for Sasakawa. Having successfully constructed and operated one oil well... Karafuto. The question of whether or not Sasakawa should receive further funding. The well had been a good success. Extracting a profitable tonnage of oil a month with no shortage in sight for a long while, the idea of a second or even third well seemed like the best way to move forward with the operation. After all, if one well was producing at an exceptional rate, surely two more would only pay for themselves. Sasakawa, of course, could obviously afford to cover the cost of construction and employing more workers. Regardless if he actually asked for it or not, the businessman would still be asking for more subsidization. Once again, Prime Minister Ino would make the decision as to how much Sasakawa would be receiving. A great deal of money had already been invested in the oil wells. Caution spoke of providing a reduced sum enough to provide Sasakawa with some motivation. Yet, with all the success that the business had seen so far, other voices suggested that even more money should be poured into the oil wells to truly access the full potential of Karafuto's oil reserves. Eventually, Eno decided to invest with. No reason to stop now. Our GDP will take a hit. Take a small hit. Ooh. A large amount. No reason to stop now. No reason to stop. How does that hurt us? Nothing yet. Ah, yeah, why not? Nothing can go bad, right? Nothing bad. Manchu Kuo, huh? Having a good time with Manchu Kuo. Let's see. Also, I do want you know that at the time of this recording, Japan apparently is not fully 100% done. Like, there's still... Like, the devs will still work on Japan. Apparently, the route that we are taking... Ta Takagi? Takagi? Takaki. Takagi. Takaki. What, however you pronounce his name. Um, he's probably the most developed leader for Japan, which is good that we want to go down his route. So, just got to keep an eye on that. 62.5. Wary. What if I wanted to slander Miki? Now, that would lower approval. That would lower this. We could lower this as well, actually. Cool. Attack publicly. Cool. Oh, wait. So, this is increased. Oh, wait. Hold on. Maybe we don't want to be doing that. Because that actually increases support here. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Well, now that I understand it better. Whatever. Murder in the Metropolis. The detective got the call late last night about a murder by the docks. It could have been the usual uh, deal gone bad over some Manchurian poppy. Some Ch Chancoro killed for bad blood. He'd seen the likes, but this was different. The report read like a guide for the perfect murder. No prints, no discernible weapon, no signs of forced entry. Just a corpse mixed in with two tons of tuna. Finally arrived at the warehouse and, and crawled underneath the police lines. Whoever did this had a strong stomach. Cutting his face up like that, he mused. Unrecognizable. The detective leaned down next to him, getting a closer look at his face. Teeth pulled. Fingers taken and a big chin moku carved into his chest. Silence. Who the heck are you? Search the scene. Search worker's body. Uh, search the body. If he's, if he's going to be that detailed with the body, search the body. This is getting weird. This is very weird. It's 62. Let's grab some better anti-tank. Why not? And get some better truckies. Or trucks, as most people will call them. So yeah, if we're doing Brazil ones, well, congratulations. If we do this, because since the conservatives are the ones leading government right now, then, uh, yeah, you're going to get more support there. Even though we do want to lower wary, so we'll see what happens. Search the body. Of course, for all the evidence that could be possibly be collected, the body remained in the center of it all. It was a grim reminder of the caliber of the crime and of the criminal who carried it out. From just the first glance, one could tell it was not a hot-blooded murder of passion and rage, but a merciless case of cold cruelty. The first task had to be to remove the body from the vat of now spoiled fish it was found in. The act itself has not posed much of a challenge, but the aftermath did. The for forensic specialist had to carefully separate the oily pieces of the fish carcass from the grisly gore of the victim centimeter by centimeter, taking care not to erase any potential evidence. Slowly but Surely, as the fish was stripped away, more details emerged from the ravaged corpse. Most notably, there did not appear to be many signs of resistance on the part of the victim. Despite the horrifying nature of the injuries, there was no abrasions to the knuckles or to indicate a struggle, nor were there any on the wrist suggesting the victim had struggles against some restraints. In fact, there were hardly any blows from blunt objects anywhere on the body, which likely would have required an, an order to subdue the victim, while more precise and painful aspects of the crime were carried out. These absences suggested something on their own, however... The victim already, or, had already been likely killed in the first few stabs, with the rest of the damage being applied post-mortem. Then there, These, then, were not likely to be acts of torture, but intimidation. But who is being intimidated? Cool, got two more divisions. Um, 
I'm not sure if we really want to make that many more divisions, to be honest with you. Yeah, we're going to make these divisions. We'll make some tanks. Lower to, lower to one, because it costs money. And I really want to focus on more special forces. Oh, look at that. That's an ability, not bad. Especially, well, as some of you guys put it in the comments from yesterday's video, seeing the shrimp boat incident will be kind of interesting later on. But fortunate foresight. Eventually, the forensic, forensic experts were finished with documenting the crime scene and turned to move the body from its fishy resting place at the request of the detective. The body was to be taken directly to the morgue where he would oversee the autopsy personally. Three officers with a thick latex gloves and face masks carefully lifted the corpse out of the vat and onto the stretcher, but as they laid the deceased man down onto the platform, one happened to notice something peculiar. Something appeared to roll from inside the man's abdomen, causing a strange bulge right next to one of the largest wounds. Ooh. Wondering if some fish had found its way into the body's chest cavity, the officer pulled open the wound to get a better look inside. Oh, God. But it was not a con con condensed ball of tuna. Rather, it was a military-issue hand grenade entangled in a mess of wires leader deeper leading deeper into the crevices of the corpse. Fortunately, after the initial shock, the officer had the good sense to scream for everyone to get out of the building and to call the bomb squad. Forty-five minutes later, the bomb squad reemerged from the plant and confirmed it was safe to go in, thanking the forensic expert who volunteered to assist them. Unfortunately, the bomb squad had been much more concerned with defusing the explosives than they were with preserving the integrity of the evidence on the body, but all that soon became irrelevant when the detective began looking over the components removed from the corpse and found a fingerprint right beneath the ring of the grenade. Well, that almost blew up in her faces. Wow, really? You're going to leave it with that? <laughs> oh, man, that sounds like a lot of fun. Bombshell evidence. With great care on the part of the forensics team, they managed to triple the quantity of evidence found from the bomb components retrieved from the corpse. In total, they found three fingerprints, one just beneath the ring of the grenade, another one on its handle, and a lone thumbprint on its base. As for the rest of the parts, nothing else could be found on them. It seemed that what whoever had assembled the bomb had become careless at the critical moment, perhaps overcome with fear of handling or handling live explosives. In terms of sheer force, the bomb itself was nothing extraordinary. It was nothing more than a hand grenade and a few gunpowder charges crudely wired to a rudimentary timing device. By the bomb squad's estimation, they had not noticed a bomb when they did. It likely would have gone off within the half hour, a fortunate break to say the least. Likely it was not meant as some form of convoluted terror attack, but as a means of destroying evidence with the added benefit of another layer of intimidation. But what the bomb lacked in power, it made up for its alarming nature. How was it that a military issue grenade could appear here in all of places. To answer that question, the detective could only turn to the aforementioned fingerprints, which of course entailed a long and arduous task of visually comparing the prints with the nearly endless collection of the Tokyo Police Records, with nothing else to, else to be done. The detective sighed as he picked up the case files from his desk and began the long march to the records room. Police work isn't all car chases and gunfights, you know. I want to... That's kind of, kind of very, very interesting. We got a little bomb stuff about the wolf who cried, boy. No, nope, we're not reading that yet. Scandal. Politician undermines the emperor. Yukio Akiyama slipped out of the door just outside the National Diet, wearing a brown coat long, or a brown long coat, and deep shaded glasses. He held his fedora as he skipped down the steps, ushering himself out of the view of the crowds of press, yelling and commotion beat at him as cameras clicked and flashed. The rush of questions and accusations filled the thick air with embarrassment and flushes of confusion. Akiyama coughed up scattered replies and broken insults towards the tumbling masses of reporters blinded by the flashes of more cameras, unable to get a word in amidst the allegations tossed in his face of rival politicians in the diet. A microphone was hurled in his face, prompting him to answer for his crimes. Akiyama cleared his throat and explained his criticism of extrajudicial killings in northwestern China by the military, even detailing his support for the same legal system in which the emperor was the sovereign of. Before he could finish his statement, the reporters hissed back at him, scoffing with more extreme accusations of treason. Akiyama's face colored further... Uh, in frustration as he rushed through the crowd of reporters slandering his every step. Images of his face circulated in the press the next day, branding him as a traitor and an opportunist. Followed by the news of his resignation, his words to condemn military operations in China were shortened and trimmed to fit the articles, most branding him as a threat to the empire. <clears throat> the news, although alarming, quickly siphoned him out of the political affairs and discussion of the violent happenings was not to occur again. Who cares for the truth? The liberal faction's power increases somewhat good, and public approval decreases somewhat. Minimizing expenditures. Me with investors. Ooh, I like civilian factories. Ooh, fudge the numbers. Just a little bit, but let's meet with investors. I like civilian factories. Among the most important figures keeping the economy of the sphere running are the investors of the empire. These hard-working <clears throat> and moral men wisely use their funds to invest in the empire's prosperity and help it grow further. The most prominent of these are the Zaibatsu, who pour money into Japan's projects within the sphere to bring further prosperity and harmony. We shall talk to these men and see if they're willing to give more of their finance and spirit to empower Japan. And unfortunately, we are, of course, out of oil, as we're trying to continue training our navy. <clears throat> the redacted record. 
Much to the detective's delight, the process of comparing and matching the fingerprints had taken less time than he anticipated. By working just a handful of junior officers to, be, to, to the bone for a few days, he'd managed to compile a stack of probable matches and their corresponding files, of course. Most were rough approximations, and they were limited to those who had their fingerprints on file already, but there was little else that could be done. Most of the profiles from the potential matches were typical Tokyo criminal lowlife. Thugs and drug dealers, low-level gangsters and enforcers, the proto prototypical scum that the police force fought often against. <clears throat> But while most certainly fit the character profile, none had any obvious meaningful connection to the particular circumstances of the crime. But for one such record, that lack of detail only drew more suspicion. There was, there was on set, a prince, a set of prints that matched those found on the bomb quite closely. Debatably, the closest of them all. <clears throat> but the only file it corresponded to was a single redacted arrest record, the original source of the prints. Both the name and circumstances of the crime had been struck from the record. <clears throat> generously coated in black ink bars that died of the page. Beyond that, there was no reason given for why the record had been censored, no accompanying paperwork of notice of change. The only pieces of identifying information were the picture of unnamed men, uh, or man, an average-sized man with short black hair and a scarred glass or gas above his right eye in the name of the filing officer, some Takahara down at the central police station. Perhaps he would be able to offer some insight. I'll call a cab. <clears throat> Ring, ring, ring. Can I get a cab over here? Sorry, I had to do that. Uh, the burnt files. The next day, the detective got the bad news from one of his officers who had been stationed to guard the crime scene of the plant. It turned out the forensic teams had not been as thorough as they had thought, and ended up missing something they really, really important. <clears throat> After the detectives and specialists had left the scene for the night, the officer had been diligently patrolling the grounds on high alert for any sign of the killer returning to the scene of the crime. But as he made his way past the plant, he found what they had missed. <clears throat> A small pile of ashes on top of faint, scorched marks on the ground, long since cooled by the night air and already beginning to spread over the surrounding area, motivated by the infrequent gusts of wind. Among the ashes were a few scraps and shreds of paper, some of them with marginally discernible writing on them, from various bits that were found that could still be read. It was obvious that the papers had been once files or records of some sort, and they had been burnt extremely recently. <clears throat> but where did they come from? Was the killer's true objective? Was this it? And the murder was just incidental? Or were they related? Either way, the detective wasn't going to leave it up to chance. Better scraps than nothing, I guess. <clears throat> Interesting. The collapse of the triumvirate. Up in smoke, my friends. Oh, good. Very good. So, despite the best efforts of the detective and the staff of the forensics lab, hardly anything could be gleaned from the blackening or the blacked scraps of paper that had been retrieved from the crime scene. Many of the scraps that had survived were extremely brittle and fragile, splitting into smaller pieces or dissolving into ash at the slightest touch, but really, this was no great loss because most were either already unreadable or contained contextless words, or fragments of sentences that provided no leads or useful information. The only thing that was somewhat readable were the centers of a few pages from the latter half of the pile. Their headers and margins had been swallowed up by, swallowed up by the flames and circling the remaining text in black rings. Unfortunately, this meant that there was no names or otherwise identifying information to be found among the lucky survivors. All they gave were some rough descriptions of the fish plant and its operation, nothing to suggest why it had been chosen for the crime. One thoroughly burned scrap made a few references to payment but gave no context to suggest that it was concerned with anything more than standard business transactions. With nothing else to be done, the detective begrudgingly placed the ash and pages back into their dedicated environment-proof bag and returned them to the evidence locker. Despite the flames, the lead had gone cold. If only we'd been faster. I should have chosen the, the grounds to look at, but, you know, whatever. Things happen. Cool. Hey, 16. Not bad. Very, very good. Keep expanding, and the leaky faucet gets the wrench. Because of how late it had been when the body was found, most of the plant workers had likely been gone when the crime took place. Their shifts had been ending, or having ended, many hours before the call came in. That meant, for the most part, they would be able to provide very little detail about the circumstances of the crime when the detective came knocking. However, one worker, a shift lead, had been passing by the plant on his way home when he happened to see a suspicious figure on the property, and then decided to call the police. When the responding officers arrived, he let them inside to search the premises, where they found the body. While the detective and forensic teams worked the site, he had stayed to give a statement, but not left long after. Eager to get a more detailed and complete testimony, the detective got his name from the deputies who took his statement and confirmed it against the name of the dispatcher received during the initial call. Over the next few days, he made several calls to the shift manager's listened number while intermittently interviewing other workers, but each time received no reply. Eventually, the detective got fed up and went to the man's address in person to confront him. But when he got there, he found the front door slightly ajar. After calling out a few times and identifying himself as police, the detective pulled his pistol from its holster and carefully entered the house. In the first room, past the hall, the detective found the shift manager, lying face down in a pool of partially dried blood. This is just the beginning. This is getting this this is getting really interesting. 
We can't get that far in time at all, but this is really cool. Twins in death. Unfortunately, the shift worker was left in a grisly state similar to that of the victim. His chest and stomach were covered in a nearly dozen slashes and stab wounds. His neck bore matching wounds, deep and savage, likely the final wound that had drained the life from the poor man. And once again, the same ominous mark appeared gorged or gouged into flesh and accented by dry blood. Chim Chin Moku. Silence. This time, however, rather than being proudly and boldly displayed in the center of the chest, the shift worker's ma mark was etched into his left shoulder. Ow. But where the previous victim's character had been smooth and deliberate with ne neatly traced lines, this one was jagged and shaky. The killer must have been in a hurry, the detective concluded, basing his judgment off the comparatively sloppy work. This wasn't a carefully planned, premeditated murder. This was on a whim, or perhaps out of necessity. But beyond the sign of the killer's gruesome haste, there was little more to be gleaned from the body. It seems speed did not quite translate to carelessness on the part of the killer. Still, the splatters and drops of blood found around the entryway to demonstrate that this had been no simple task. The shift lead must have fought every step of the way against a vicious assailant, fiercely resisting him from the moment he burst through the door right up until his collapse into his final resting place on the living room floor. But it wasn't enough. What is going on? The interrupted meeting. Tracking down Officer Takahara was easy enough. His schedule for the day had him scheduled to be on call from the Tokyo Central Police Station itself. The detective felt somewhat weird about a confront or about confronting a fellow officer about a crime of, his, of this caliber. However, he figured that the officer would be able to provide some alibi to correct some misunderstood detail on their part. So he gathered up a small squad of officers and a fellow detective and made their way down to the central station. Once there, with a quick flash of their badges and a stern relaying of their intent, they were waved past the front desk and towards the general officer's hall. At first, the group could not seem to find Officer Takahara amidst the regular daily hustle and bustle of the station's officers, but one of his colleagues was kind enough to inform him that Takahara had stepped out back for a smoke break. With a curt thank you, the detective turned to the door at the far end of the room that led to the back entrance of the station, his team following behind him. When he pushed the heavy metal door, he saw no sign of Takahara, but heard some hushed words float from around the corner. Now waiting for the rest of his team to come to the door, the detective brisk, briskly rounded the corner in search of the source of the voice. There he found himself face to face with Officer Takahara, who himself had been locked in conversation with another man who looked quite like him in the passing, save for the deep scar above his right eye. There was a brief moment of silence as the three men stared at each other, but it lasted no longer than the time it took for them to reach for the weapons. The first sound was nearly the detective's shout of police, but it was just barely beaten up by gunshot. Shots fired. Oh my goodness, what is going on? What is going on in Japan here in Tokyo? What the heck? Never been in Tokyo. The view from the ground, the detective's vision was blurry. The shapes and colors of the world merged and melted with each other. With each blink, his eyelids became heavier and heavier, flicking his vision between indiscernible fog and total darkness. But for a moment, with a great amount of effort on the detective's part, his part, his vision became clear. He saw the scarred man in front of him, face down against uh, the hard concrete ground. His hands were cuffed behind him and the boot of a police officer was placed squarely on his back. Turning his eye a bit, he could see a small pool of bloody form of blood forming beneath him, trickling out of a dark hole in his leg. The detective, who also became aware of the fact the world around him was quite loud, the sounds appeared distant and garbled, but he had been so focused on looking he had hardly noticed them at all. Yet with more effort, the detective strained to hear the sounds of surroundings. First, he heard the groaning of the scarred man in the front of him, soft and indistinct. Next came the repeated pops and cracks of gunfire, accompanied by the occasional whizzing of bullets that rumbled and rumbles of impact. Finally, he turned to see one of his officers that had accompanied him crouched behind a crate and screaming into his radio. For a moment, their eyes met. He saw fear, confusion, and above all, loss. Then, as the detective's eyelids fell for one last time, the words he, he shouted became clear. Requesting backup to our location immediately, we are taking fire from a police officer at the southeastern exterior of the central station. Officer's down to repeat, officer is down. But we aren't done. Oh, man. It's only July. Ooh, this is getting spicy. Just keep making more factories, guys. Keep making more factories. Oh, we went down in factories. That's sad. Where's the next event? I want the next event! I'm so interested in what's going to happen now. <laughs> ah! Nothing tension. How's this looking? 60.5. 30.5. Oh. Hopefully things don't start falling apart for us. If anything, we could probably start siphoning off... Oh! Hey, yeah, war in the desert. What a way to treat a former ally. So we want less approval, right? Rapidly diminish the ruling faction's power, right? House of Peers. Going below 50%, the Prime Minister's reign should fall in critical danger and may collapse. Kai interactions? Well, how about we do that then? Wary? Discredit? For the, for, oh, opposition 88. How many guys do they have? 102. We currently have 153. Embellish accompaniments, huh? Use the public. Launch propaganda. So this will boost us up. Let's boost this guy down. I'm going to lose some political power. That's all right, though. Uh, Less than 60%. There you go. Nice. Cool. What happened? Where's the next event? Officer down! 
1.2 billion. Big sad, man. That's a lot of big sadness right there, I'll be honest with you. Uh, do we need to train anyone else? Man, you guys are looking old. Akira Muto? Dude, you're looking old, but stage two. The development of the Tokuku... Tokoku case that occurred while collecting evidence strongly suggests that the motivation for the murder is far more complex and calculated than initially thought. With the revelation that the killing itself was carried out by a former soldier who had seemingly no obvious reason or relation to the victim, the investigation took on a new character, whereas the officers of the ward station once combed through every gory detail of the case over tables and cross desks. There's not only a stern silence, hushed constant. Conversations were held behind closed doors. Locks on filing cabinets were now checked and double-checked, and notebooks became carefully guarded realms of speculation and secrets. <clears throat> no command or directive brought this culture to, of silence to the station. It was ushered in by the demeanor of the chief detective. Chief detective? Chief detective. He had steadily become more stoic and withdrawn as the days went by. Answers to previous questions spawned questions of their own, and before long the case looked like a hydra over the department. Given the general sense of turmoil, it was all the more surprising when the chief gathered the department before him one morning and announced that the investigation was moving to its next stage. The teams would be reorganized to shift away from field work and focus on filling the holes in the case with paper. Each group would be responsible for interacting with, requesting, and securing information from a different administrative office. Most importantly, the specific objectives of and administration obtained by each group would be strictly localized, only known within the group and to the central command of the investigation. The chief did not offer justification for that change, but none was really needed. Afterwards, or after, yeah, afterwards, the detective paused to run his eyes over the rows of silent, stone-faced men before him, looking for any sign of concern or confusion, and finally he broke the silence. No questions, he asked, but the stoic men kept their silence, glancing between them and the detective. Okay, then he continued, this is what we're going to do. The investigation gains momentum. Oh, man. Oh man, oh man, oh man. Currently get 1.1 political power day. Hey, you got recons. Companies, that's, that's not too bad, right? Symbolic measures. Society is currently symp sympathetic tradi tr to tradition. I apologize for speaking poorly right now. Oh my goodness. Uh, scout helos. Uh, actually, is it a transport? Eh, it doesn't matter. We're going to get them done anyways. So, Meet with the investors. Ah, oh, don't mind if we do. Expand lobbying. Eh, that's kind of okay. Fudge the numbers. Minimize expenditures, that's not too bad. In addition to keeping growth high, we must not forget to cut on down, cut down on unnecessary costs. Infrastructure that needs frequent repairs creates more jobs and saves us money right now, after all. We shall cut off unnecessary luxuries across all of the Empire, which our people will survive with their strong spirit. The Japanese of our Empire need not worry too much, however, as much of our cuts will be in benefits for the lazier of the sphere members who refuse to pull their weight despite our benevolence. Which we lose 50 political power, that's not good. Are you still guys still fighting over here? Learning the rules. <clears throat> Evidence to suggest the existence of a wider conspiracy does not, in turn, give clearance to boldly burst our way through the organs of the state on the pretense of, obs of obstruction of justice, said the chief detective, slowly pacing before his men, rather. We must take the opposite position, in a sense. We must carefully plan our actions before we make them, as well as anticipate and prepare for the result of said actions. He came to a stop and turned to gaze over the uniformed soldiers assembled in the rows of chairs before him. He knew all their faces, the, the names that went with them, and the desks they normally appeared behind. Some of them were veterans of the service, officers and detectives who had given a large portion of their times and lives to the Tokyo Police Service. Others were newer, recent graduates from police academies, transfers from other departments, or military men who wanted a change of face. Weighing this, the chief resumed. Previously, we have used our obligation to enforce the law like a hammer, smashing aside all obstacles to reveal the information we desire. Here, however, the key is superior to the battering ram. The fierce rivalries between and within the branches of the military and government have encouraged the growth of a culture of underhanded opportunism. It permeates through the offices and conference rooms of the administration and clouds the judgment of those within. That is the weakness we must exploit. The conditions that motivate the crime will be its perpetrator's undoing. With that, he gathered his papers from the podium and in front of him into a pile, straightened it with two quick taps against the podium, and walked away from the meeting room. As soon as he disappeared from the doorstep or doorway, his subordinates rose with the chorus of their chair's legs scraping against the lin linoleum floors and set to the tasks. Nobody said it would be easy. Actually, let's look at that. This stuff. And then you come over here. Paranoia is only 23.5%. As currently the Navy's currently dominating. So I think we're pretty much doing okay. Then we have a lot of support from the Navy. And not a lot of support from the Army. Which is, eh, cool. Paranoia will increase. Oh, so they have to be balanced. Equal favor. So if we do that, promote officers. Ooh. If we do this, we get more money. More paranoia available every month. We lose money. There you go. There you go. I want to balance these guys out a little bit better. So, Naiji Tenu Hogoi Hansai Kai Kinen. Alright, cool. Today, the 50th anniversary of the passing of Emperor Naiji was observed. Major 
Major parades in Kyoto, Osaka, and Tokyo were organized. Many schools had prepared special lessons on the life and deeds of the late emperor, and the Kyoto Imperial University released a three-volume biography. The first about his life before the restoration up into the abolishment of the Han system. The second about courtly life and reforms in the early period, and the third about his later life starting from the Sino Japanese War of 1894. The emperor lived through the important renovation of Japanese state and culture, born in Kyoto, the year before Commodore Perry forced the Bakufu to open the country, which led to actions that participated in bringing it down and leading the way towards imperial rule in 1868. Under his wise oversight, Japanese society experienced a breakneck modernization. Modern schools, industrial bases, and a modern armory were, de were developed. Most importantly, the Maiji constitution was established under his reign, which continues to be upheld even to this day, and in addition to setting his initial vestiges of the Japanese Empire in Choson and Taiwan. While the Japanese people revere the contributions made by Maiji, whether his legacy is upheld till this day is still up for debate, especially amidst the and bureaucratic ch chaff of the current administration. Tenu Haika Banzai. Actually, I did want to see. So, are we increasing this at all? Like down here? It doesn't seem like anything's getting better or worse, but we have debauchery. Ooh, a debauchery. Anything. Oh, well, poverty's slowly getting better. It's only 10 to 15%. Not bad, not bad. Like, hopefully, it doesn't get any worse. Hopefully, this doesn't go down at all. Uh, after Fujiwara gave a speech over the economic restrictions in place for the public due to the national mobilization law that gripped the attention of the House of Peers, he was met with immense applause. He took a bow and returned to a seat amongst his allies in the chamber. A chatter flooded the Great Hall as each of the peers had discussed amongst one another while civil servants arranged documents, wrote lists, and passed around files relating to the dis debate debatable topics at hand. Dozens of members found about their seats, some debating among themselves over the session that just ended and about their potential or personal lives following the brief moments of snickering. Member Fujiwara was one amongst these groups as he swiveled behind him to discuss the lavish new cars he had been or had bought with the money shared by party members the night before in an evening entertainment session. Thinking he could not be heard, he continued to smirk with his colleagues over the fun they had and the riches they can now spend on. He sniffed after a great laugh and heard the echo of the microphones throughout the chamber, immediately glancing at the center of the room to see most of the st standing peers gazing at him. <clears throat> Fujiwara glanced in different directions around the room with an embarrassment or embarrassing flush creeping over his face. He swallows a dry mouthful of air and took a deep breath before disconnecting the microphone under the judging eyes of dozens of his political rivals. The images of the newly washed cars, the young woman, and the expensive wines burned through his head as he shrunk in the chair from his embarrassment, his suit clinging onto him from the sudden coating of sweat he was now lathered in. Or lathered in. Latherton. His eyes drifted towards the president of the House of Peers, whose eyes were round and hateful, and he ex exhaled slowly, placing his hand over his chin and remaining stiffly silent for the rest of the session. There's no coming back from this. Oh, debauchery. Oh, baratia. They're about. No, don't say it so. No, no. Sablinsky. Friend of friends in the right places, smoke from the chief detective's cigarette wafted towards the ceiling as he leaned back in his office chair. It rippled past the frosted glass windows that separated his office from the common area that housed the desks of the department's officers and detectives. Two of such detectives sat in front of him now, each in an uncomfortable metal chair half a meter away from his hulking mass of polished wood that served as the chief's desk. <clears throat> One was senior detective Kodaira, a long-standing veteran of the Tokyo police, his age beginning to show in his wrinkles around his eyes and the dusting of gray hairs on his head. The other was a younger man transferred from a department in Osaka named Tai Chi, or Ta Taiki. He had served as an officer for a number of years prior, followed by a handful more as a detective. While his senior remained somewhat relaxed in his chair, the young detective leaned forward to speak. What I'm trying to say, sir, he began, is that, given the circumstances, it would make sense to establish an informal network inside key offices beforehand, rather than trying to build a network of contacts as we go along. The chief tapped a cigarette on the rim of a, of his, of a glass ashtray, one of the few things that sat on his otherwise barren desk. What do you mean by informal, he asked. Unofficial connections mostly, Kodaira interjected. Former contacts for old cases, friends of friends, old army buddies, whatever. People who we could ask to take care of the pen and paper tasks that bureaucrats are usually not so motivated to do. All with the understanding that their effort is deeply appreciated by the Tokyo Police Service, who will happily remember or forget their contributions depending on what they prefer. And because of the rather sensitive nature of their operation... Tachi said, we be we think it to best to limit our network to one major government working group. Otherwise, we risk alerting the conspirators if they find out half their offices goes down for coffee at the station once a week. For our purposes, we recommend either the Army, Navy, or Diet Administration, sir. The Army. Seems like our GDP is growing, and this is not growing too much. Showa no hi, or no he. Rejoice and cheer carried throughout the streets of the Empire of Japan in celebration of the birthday of Emperor Showa. His Imperial Majesty's new life of, is commemorated by 
all from Taiwan to Hokkaido, in a festival honoring the age of peace, fraternity, and cooperation in Japan and its Asian brothers now live in. During the reign of Emperor Showa, the empire had grown in strength and in size to international superpower status. Now, no one dared challenge Japan like they did before the rule of his imperial majesty. It was under his rule that the empire had won against imperialism in the Greater East Asia War, and under his rule that the mighty Court Prosperity Sphere was founded to preserve the sacred peace. Millions gathered to observe the holiday in public or at home did wish good health upon the emperor, so that his prosperous and just rule might continue long into the future. Tenno Haika Banzai Opening the Japan Korea Tunnel, awesome! The long-awaited Japan-Korea Tunnel was finally opened today after over 15 years of construction. The initial Shinkansen project was extended to go into Korea, with plans for extension into Manchuria at a later date, replacing some, if not all, shipping between the Manchuria and Japan. Built on wide gauges, the tunnel included three rail lines, one for freight transport, one for passenger traffic, and one mixed line. Earlier, transit between Fusan and Fukuoka. Fukuoka was done through the ferry, an expensive and long-lasting affair, with its 13-hour duration. The new tunnel cuts this down to a meager four hours, a truly great day for Japan, Korea, and Asia, and this is the future. A concrete symbol of the East Asian unity. So the Tsushima project is done. Oh, that was not good. Uh, yep. Oh, we get five more civilian factories? Nice! And another infrastructure. Lovely! One, two, three, four. And five. Actually, I'm gonna, I don't mind doing some infrastructure. As long as we have four lines of civilian factories working at all times, I don't mind spending a little bit of time on Kanto's infrastructure. Hopefully they make Pokemon there later. Paper Tigers, the chief detective, sat behind his desk, carefully flicking through his roll of contact cards. Each card was given at least a moment's worth of attention, enough to read the name stamped on it in black ink. Most then were immediately flickered past and forgotten, but a few were of were worthy of another moment of consideration, and fewer still made the detective pause altogether. He searched for the names of people in the same way one would search for the name of a street. Unconcerned with the memories, thoughts, and feelings related to the names, only their usefulness as a path from one place to another. But the roads he sought led to the heart of the Imperial Monolith, and neither were easily found or traversed, doubtedly so, in the case of the Tax Bureau and the Board of audit. The tax bureau was the attack dog of the Ministry of Finance. Many aspiring gang leaders or captains of industry had their dreams dashed by the discerning gaze and careful calculations of its agents. The bureau demanded information in torrents of paperwork for accuracy, consistency, and redundancy, and it amassed a horde of data in an impossibility or an impossibly intricate filing system. It nearly an intelligence agency in its own right, devoted to the single purpose of following and securing the revenue of the Empire. By contrast, the Board of Auto is a reclusive agency, shunned by the ministries of the cabinet. This made little difference to its officials. In some sense, it was preferable. They existed to examine the finances and records of the various public institutions that spread around the Empire, but the Board's position in the hierarchy was artificial. In a sense, they reported to the Diapo were subordinate only to the Emperor, while well, they acted with the divine purpose of exposing the subverses who exploited the Empire for personal gain, and had done so in the past from time to time. In recent years, the officer had fallen silent. The Chief leaned back into his chair, judging or juggling an unlit cigarette between two fingers. Two names sat now before him, one to each office. He picked, considered for a moment longer, and then reached towards to pick up the phone, talk to the taxman, ask an auditor. Hmm. Paper Tigers, Tax Bureau. If we want to be slick about this and inconspicuous, we would probably want to use the Board of Audit, right? Ministry of Finance. I like the Tax Bureau. I really do. Let's go with an Auditor, though. Let's go with an Auditor. Why not? We'll see what happens. Yeah, this is not going up, which is good, it seems like, but, but the GDP is still growing faster, which is nice. Hey, we have a deficit. Yes. Yes, keep the deficit. The parallel approach. Detective Taichi and Kodaira stood up, or stood under, actually, the canopy that covered the entrance to the Tokyo Central Police Station. They stood side by side, not quite facing each other, but not quite facing away. Their backs to the door. Each held a cigarette. Smokers, Taichi in his left hand, and Kodaira in his right, which they would raise to their lips every now and then. Between them, four cigarette butts sat crushed on the ground. Please don't litter. How it seems to me, said Kodaira, pausing to pull on his cigarette, is that we have two angles to approach this case at. One is through the killer himself, who he was, where he came from, how he ended up here, his tragic backstory, all that nonsense. The other is, through the circumstances of the killing, why did it happen, where it did, when it did, and the way it did. And you think it's a matter of picking the right one, Tai Chi asked. Or Tachi. Maybe Tachi, actually. That's just it, replied Kodaira, eagerly inhaling another puff. Puff, puff. If there really is a conspiracy, or at least one going further than we found already, then none of the details would have been left to chance. What I mean is, it's not just about where those angles lead, it's about where they overlap. Tachi turned to look at him. So what do you suggest, he asked. Two teams. Each of us leading one. One focuses on the criminal, the other on the crime. <clears throat> We keep the specifics local to our teams, but you and I meet privately to discuss, compare, and coordinate. Maximum coverage, minimal risk, and you know how much I enjoy rooting out or through the personal effects of the deranged and disturbed. Kodera said with a smirk, but I think I'll let you take the lead in that respect, seeing as you have yet 
to have the chance since you got here. Consider this is an impromptu field lecture on Tokyo criminal psychology, he said, bringing the remains of the cigarettes or cigarette back to his lips. Tachi flashed a quick smile. Uh, smile. Quick smile smiled in reply before he dropped the smoldering ends of his cigarettes on the ground and crushed it beneath the sole of his scuffed leather shoe. That settles it then. Man, don't litter, especially in the police station or outside the police station. That's not cool. Someone's got to clean that later. I could cut this, but I think we're doing okay now. So no wonder the deficit's not growing anymore. Knowing what we don't know. A five-man crowded around the worn table in the meeting room of the ward police station. Three were police officers, each clad in a dark blue uniform and carrying a shining badge of office and a clip at their waists. The other two were detectives, Tachi and another recent transfer to the team. All of them leaned over a college of a collage of files, documents, and pictures carefully arranged in a half circle around a picture of Ryo Takahara. So in total, said Tachi, uh, the other four men turning to face him as he spoke. We know three central th things about Taha Takahara here. First, that he killed Shinji Yoshikagi Okage in a very specific manner, despite no apparent relation between them. Second, he is a member of the armed forces, very likely the army. And third, he had a half-brother in the Tokyo police force willing to assist him. The rest of the group nodded in reply. So that gives us with two major avenues of, of investigation, he continued. We have the military angle, finding out what the military knew about him and what he did for them. Or we can cover the basics, as we would in a normal case. Establish a broader background, get a general sense of who he was as a person, what his social groups were, his habits, and so on. Regardless, our goal is to construct a motivation from his prior actions, and from there, try to form a reasonable connection to the further their priorities. Three of the men nodded again, but the fourth, a bright-eyed young officer from the south, cleared his throat to speak. Sir, given the circumstances of the case, is that the fact that the suspect had a brother on the police force? Should we consider that an angle of investigation too? Tachi hesitated a moment before replying. At this stage, we are missing so much that the basic facts of the case that I don't think we ha can make real headway into a related internal investigation at the moment. If there is more to be found inside the force, going in blind will only make it more difficult. So, with all that being said, I propose we take the military route, establish a basic profile. Hmm. Do you do the military or basic profile? Military angle, find what the military knew about him and what he did for them. Or, oh, hmm. Just because you're in the military doesn't mean you doesn't really mean too much. It can mean that, but not necessarily. Uh, or we get a broader background, get a sense of who he was as a person, what his social groups were. That's probably better to figure out that one. Establish a basic profile. Then from there, maybe we can do a military military backgrounds, cover, information, gathering. I can't speak right now. Under the spotlight, though, Detective Tachi rubbed his eyes and yawned. He sat alone at his desk in the darkened station office. The usual hustle and bustle had long given way to a steady silence. His desk lap provided a small pool of light illuminating Tachi as if he were an actor upon a stage. Looking outside the windows, the sky was as dark as the office. But at the, this hour, light from the cars, signs, and streetlights of Tokyo poured through the glass and drew shadows on the walls of the station. Tachi looked down at the papers arrayed on his desk before him. They were the results of the team's efforts to establish a general background on the Rio Takahara. And the intention had been to begin compiling the next day, but Tachi chose to stay late to begin the process himself, not having any spouse or children to return to like some of his colleagues. By all accounts, Takahara was thoroughly average. He had been an average student, both in conduct and exams. He had chosen to enlist in the General Infantry Corps after his final year of school with no obvious intention of pursuing a specialized rule or command. He had been picked up twice for bar fights, but never mounted anything more than a night in custody. The only noteworthy thing in the past, or that, that respect, was an arrest six months ago for the possession of illegal substances. However, no further information was given in the reports, and it seemed that he was released the next day without an incident. The detective frowned. None of the other files had implied anything related, related to drugs. But Takahara's medical records were not included in the bundle, as the records were not centralized, and tended to move as the patient did, requiring some effort to track down. Of course, Tachi could not help but notice a curious police record. An apparent repeat offender was consistently let go, even after more severe charges were applied. In all likelihood, this was the work of the brother, Officer Takahara, suggesting there was more to the cooperation. Track down the medical records, review Officer Takahara. Oh, man. It seems like whatever we choose, this is going to be very, very bad for us. Or good. I mean, yeah, he had some drugs in his system. Maybe he was dealing with something. Maybe. That could be really important. Every we review his brother, though, uh, he could get away with stuff. Which, yeah, there might be corruption there, too. Both. I wish we could take both routes. Why not? Uh, medical records? The officer. Medical records. I mean, yeah, he did some illegal drugs, but I want to go with review the officer. You got to dig up corruption where corruption is, right? At least we know that there is corruption here somewhere. And if we were to cut civilian spending by 
that could save us like a little over four billion dollars. So that could help us cut stuff down, but whatever. The criminal's broth. At a glance, Officer Takahara and his brother Ryo, Ryo, Ryo Takahara looked quite similar. They both had dark brown eyes, short cut black hair, and almost had the same physique. But as usual, as usually the case, the longer one stared at the two men, the more the individual subtleties stood out. Almost the same could be said of their respective lifestyles. On the surface, they were both men of long order, Ryo as a soldier and his brother as a police officer, but again, a casual glance over the details revealed the key difference of or key points of differentiation. Both men seized upon their upon their upon their respective opportunity with what seemed to be entirely different intentions for Ryo. Uh, or Ryo. It served as a means to escape what he saw as a drudgery of civil life, but for his brother, the purpose was the opposite. It was a means to propel himself upwards in the social environment he was found himself in. Indeed, where Ryo, or Ryo, had a tendency to meander around the middle ground, his brother tended, tended to shine. Officer Takahara was highly regarded within the Tokyo police station, particularly for an officer who had only served three years until that point. His records contained a long list of con co commendations from his superiors and public officials, but lacked a single citation. What Officer Takahara's records also lacked, however, was any reference to the incidents involving his brother. If he had been involved in preventing any charges from sticking to Ryo, he was careful to ensure that he did so quietly. In fact, his records contained no reference to Ryo at all, not even a casual indication that he had a brother. In order to gain any insight into the circumstances surrounding the arrest, the investigation would need to refine their search. Detective Tachi ordered his team to collect and review the files specifically pertaining to Ryo's arrests, as well as any and all that included or mentioned Officer Takahara. As it would turn out, that was a a lot. Better get started. Military austerity. Oh, that didn't really do much for us. Hey, okay, that did quite a bit for us. Less than, well, more than 200 billion, huh? Nice. Oh, we have actually some reserves. Now, before I did increase this, I'm going to do this one at this time. It doesn't, basically does nothing but whatever. Four steps deeper. The initial forays into the police archives proved unsuccessful. What few files that could be found relative to Ryo Takahara's arrest contained few details and offered little insight. Worse still, none of them made any reference to his brother, Officer Takahara, or gave any evidence to suggest he had directly manipulated the proceedings of Ryo's arrests. With the paper trail beginning to falter, the investigation group under Detective Tachi turned to examine Officer Takahara's case records as a whole. In doing so, the team collectively made four key observations. The first was that over the past year, Officer Takahara had responded to five separate calls to the specific fish processing plant where Shinji Yoshikage's body was found. Three times to remove the trespassers from the premises and two times to respond to reports of an attempted break-in on its own. This observation was not so suspicious, however, upon wider scrutiny. The second observation was made. Those five calls were the only calls for police made from the plant throughout the entire year. Still, it was not outside the realm of chance. The third observation was a more general mundane one. Officer Takahara's call record seemed to overwhelmingly consist of responses to suspected petty crime in industrial and seaside commercial zones. For the most part, the reports concerning these calls were extremely sparse. Usually they claimed that either Takahara took a statement and left, or that the situation was resolved without much consequence. The fourth and final observation was made by Detective Kodaira, Kodaira while he and Detective Tachi were consolidating their team's work. The vast majority of the properties that Takahara responded to at calls were owned by one specific conglomerate, the Minazaka Kosho Kabushiki Gaisha, the same conglomerate that owned the fish plant Yoshikage was found in. There will ha has to be more. Keep digging. Keep, 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 keep digging. Can we get at least one more focus before we end the episode? We're only 57 minutes into this video, and yes, we can. It took us that long to get through another focus, and we lost 50 political power. Uh, adjust the budget. Oh, yeah, Mark. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, why not? Another issue is in the budget, which is in need of updating. The needs of our brave armies and courageous navies are constantly shifting, as so the needs of the helpless people of the sphere who need our benevolence. We should continue to adjust the budget accordingly. So, I think that's where we're going to end today's episode. We've done okay. We've made sure that our support is going to go, probably going to go down. We have high support in the House of Peers, though, but we'll see what happens in the next episode since it just turned to September 1962. But regardless, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below if you haven't already, and I'll see you tomorrow as we watch the far eastern side of Russia continue to kill itself as we develop or get engaged more with the story and the detectives and the murders. Thanks for watching, though, and have a great rest of your day.